each Sunday night. I'd watch the practice with none of my friends. I'd turn the dial to ABC to see the creep of the week that Bobby Donald defends. But I'm out of practice. With your host, Keith Varney. And the always excited Mike and Deglio. Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I missed the practice. There was no TiVo, what could I do? Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it on Hulu. I try not to give away spoilers, but guys, it's the return of Joey Harris. I'm always excited to join you for the podcast, but today I am exuberant! Yeah! Yes! And welcome to the Out of Practice Podcast, a weekly podcast in which my old buddy Mike and I discuss David E. Kelly's award-winning series, The Practice. This week, after a run of... uh, Disappointing. I, I'm not mad. I'm disappointing. Disappointed episodes uh, throughout season six, guys. Very exciting. Uh, spoiler alert in the title. There's no point in pretending it's not going to happen. We're going to talk about season six, episode eighteen, the return of Joey Herrick. Who? How's it going, Mike? Uh, it's going great, man. I uh, I think as we've said the past few uh, the past few weeks. We've been busy, we've been stressed out, lots of stuff going on. Most of that is in the past now. Uh, I have a little bit of a stretch of time here that is less stressful. I've gotten back to watching some TV, doing some r and I have been to the beach, going on vacation in like two weeks, three weeks. I'm really oh, yeah? psyched. Wait, where are you going? Uh, we're going up to the cabin uh, to spend a week unplugged so we're gonna have to talk about doubling up some point although we have enough of the other show in the can we got to get this one in there nice Uh, yeah things are good man and now and then so i was excited to join you today anyway just to talk chit chat do some things but then i don't actually see any of the information for the episode until i sit down to do the pre-work it's about half an hour of setup usually and uh (laughs) i saw joey's face i've been asking and you've been so good at making it seem like He's not probably not coming back, or you never know. we don't know. And uh, so <laughs> this was like a little bit of Christmas today when I saw his face. Oh my goodness! Yes, yeah. Well, and I, it's an interesting decision on their part to just give it away in the title. But I think they were like, guys, like the ratings are probably slipping just a hair, and they're like, let's not, you know, let's let's not gild the lily here. Like it's Joey Herrick; he's coming I back. I suspect this was like because you got to remember. Kids, uh, mm, the, mm. you st- you didn't even have the guide button on your TV. You had to pick up the TV guide, which was like That's a magazine true. that you got in the mail. And mm-hmm. if there was like a big return for somebody, probably it might not have been on the on the cover because the show wasn't like huge at the time. But there was definitely a splash on the page somewhere, and so you'd see, oh my God, Joey Herrick, I got to tune in. Nope, I don't know if DVR was even happening at this point. So you had to hit that VHS, get it ready to record. Yeah, I think this was the absolute earliest I, I don't think TiVo was out yet I might be wrong but I don't think so I had a video capture card and a tuner in mm-hmm. my computer so technically I could record uh stuff off of the air however it was terrible yeah, it wasn't uh, great it wasn't great it wasn't great it wasn't great and Lord knows getting uh, trying to time that up was a little bit better than the old timey VCR you had to program oh that kids You'll never know. You'll never know the terror of did I actually set it to record the game correctly? Is it did I do seven a.m. or seven p.m. and you got to press the button seventeen times so it gets to, and then like another button to confirm. It was terrible. It was terrible. Anyway, uh, hooray! One more we don't thing have to do that. Anymore. I want to point out. Sorry, we're all over the place. But before I forget, I uh, recently did a couple gigs for for this other. I think we showed a video last week. Schmerzy, I got a little. Schmerzy. Yeah, I got a little bit of uh, 
a little bit of uh, a cash for that, and I wanted to like treat myself. So I had been flirting with an iPad, and you know they're they're on the expensive side. And oh yeah, as is all Apple products. Though I always think any Apple product, your return on investment is very sound because they're mm-hmm. great. Uh, however, I was doing a pros cons list of like eh, this is like really a luxury item because I really don't need it. I have my work computer, I have a laptop, all this stuff. Right. <laughs> But I have to tell you that in the pro column, because, <laughs> you know, it comes with the Apple Pencil. You can do jots and notes and stuff. <laughs> I re- literally put down, for work, take notes, hi, Koopsie, for oops. <laughs> <laughs> that is why you needed an $1,100 iPad you didn't need. Uh, well, luckily, uh, the educational discount, it, it wasn't that expensive. But that said, I have it. I'm going to take the notes. Uh, <laughs> for the high company for work. Tech, work. I, I love how you call it work. Well, you know, it's a small business. It's very small, but small <laughs> nonetheless. Is it a business? It's small. I don't know if it's a business. But uh, no, I honestly, like I, uh, about this time last year, got my first iPad. And I got an old used like pro version one. So it, it was only like 400 bucks, but I use that every damn day. It's awesome. You know, it's like when you want to surf, your phone is usually good for it, but sometimes you want a little bit of extra and you got to Yeah. You got to do well, it. I mean for me and you know, and I struggle with this because uh I I'm old, I'm an old school musician and I I prefer a hard copy. I want to mm-hmm. turn pages. I want to look at two pages at once. And, you know, and I know like the environmentalist in me is like, what are you doing, buddy? Get get with the times. Uh, but it is really handy to be able to have access to everything I've ever written on my iPad, wherever I go in the world. And uh, and Fourscore allows you to, to, to work through it pretty easily. So the future is nice now, man. Tech. The future, future is, now. is now. Well, uh, Apple, if you're listening, we'll happily review the latest iPad on YouTube. You just have to send us one. Sure. Yeah, I'm in. For our uh, for our two listeners. All right. Well, let us continue forward and talk about our most important listeners and or people who sit in the back of the room and silently judge us while we podcast in a segment we call... We have tried for years to make this podcast a success. We failed! It's time to give the world what it was. Meow, meow! Hot cat content. Meow, meow. <laughs> Hot cat content. Meow, meow. Hot cat content. Mike has 25 more seconds to tell us what's going to happen in this episode. And now, and, and now he's got no audio. Boy, stuff is I, going. Did I disappear? Uh, oh, there no, you me? are. Now you're back. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. So all kinds it's, of all kinds of shit's happening. Mashing buttons all over the place. <clears throat> yes. Talk to me about the cat, uh, or do you have any questions for me? Because I'm, I'm prepping something, Keith, for a little story I want to tell you. So that's why I'm. It looks oh, like I'm working, I see. So, working so furiously you, over here. So you you want me to fill uh, while you prepare? Well, uh, first off, I'm very excited about your cat, and I'll let you talk about it, but I've, I've got some updates uh, throughout the week, because I, I get updates from Mike throughout the week, and you don't. Uh, but That's uh, true. It is true you do not. This week, uh, so uh, Charlie and I have had uh, the house to ourselves, because Jillian is house-sitting another person's cat. Hey, whereabouts? Uh, in Queens, in Astoria. So oh, she got a chance to go back. Yeah, she got to be back in the hood for a week and uh, start reacclimating with the city just a little bit on the subway for the first time since March of Ooh. 20. Good freaking Lord. Uh, but anyway, so we've been texting pictures uh, of our the various cats back and forth as uh, Charlie and I, bachelorhood, running around. And by running around, basically, I watch the Olympics. He's bored silly and stares out a window. So yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's that's what we've been up to. Uh, it's been uh, It's been fun. It's been fun. Uh, yeah, things here are great with the little guy. He uh, he continues to astound me in that he's yeah. everything I wanted in a cat. He's super playful kitten style, so he plays. But like, and things are altering slightly because he's getting into the terrible whatever week he's in. But he doesn't ever like scratch up the carpet or the wall or any place you don't want him to scratch. We got a brand new couch we paid a lot of money for, and he doesn't scratch the couch. Only scratches on his scratchers, which my other cats never even sniff. They have no interest in the scratchers. He's all about that. He eats all his food. 
Uh, he made friends with the mon- with the danger cat I talked about last week. Danger and this cat. week, he started snuggling afternoon naps with my oldest cat, who has been thus far unimpressed with having a friend. But now she's he's now snuggled with both cats and is like has been truly the missing link. It's really been really awesome. He's so likable, and I I forget if I said it uh, last week, but like I thought you getting a third cat was the worst idea I could possibly eh, think of. I, most most everybody agrees with that. Yeah, and it turned out to work. So uh, I mean, who am I? Who I apparently did not know that the secret to your cat life was adding a third cat. Who knew? Um, I, we just went and visited two more cats. Not for me. No. Uh, no. For, no. For, no. For my mom. For my mom, who has expressed as she's an old, uh, she's seventy seven this year, and she's expressed she's a little lonely in my her little apartment under my brother's house. So we found these two really cool cats, Ollie and Cindy. They're brother and sister. They're like a year plus, and they're looking for a forever home. And so um, we went and visited with my mom, and I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get her some friends. Oh well, that that is a great that's that's a great idea. Cats are really good companions. They're low maintenance, uh, but they're really good companions. That's nice. My my grandfather, before he died, had a had a cat uh, for his last ten years or so, and that was really really nice uh, for both of them. They uh, they really had a good time. So uh, cool, yeah. So uh, we have a surprise segment. It's not really a surprise because well, you said nope, we were going to do yet. it. Not oh, yet. Not yet. No, no. I okay. have a little surprise before we get there. Oh, do tell. So, a little story for everybody, and it somehow it's actually going to loop back into what uh, the show's about. So my my sister, uh, her two kids are on the rambunctious side, and they've been and accused of murder, and we need times. to plan B your mom. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, great. And uh, they don't handle overnights very well. Uh, in fact, it's. One of the scariest things I've ever done in my life is trying to watch my niece overnight. She uh, she basically uh, became possessed by the devil, but that's a story for a different time. Mm-hmm. So uh, my sister had su- wanted to surprise her husband. He's a huge fan of the Sopranos, and so oh, right. there was a Soprano con uh, in Atlantic City yesterday, and she got him tickets. And she was like, hey, can you spend an overnight with the kids? To which myself and the kids... Uh, other five or six nephews and or aunts and uncles said, "Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> pass. <laughs> yeah, hard pass." So I felt a little bad, and I said, "You know what? It's only ninety minute drive. I'll drive down to Atlantic City. I'll watch the kids while you do the conference. I'll take them to the boardwalk. We'll do whatever." And uh, that's what I did. I drove down yesterday. I was going to take him to the the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, do all these things. As soon as I got there, I remembered that, uh, and no offense to anyone maybe from there, but Atlantic City is a shithole. And it's not really a place you want to bring children, yes. So I thought, you know what, the the, the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum will be okay, but then the kids were like, hey, would it be cool if we just stayed in the hotel room and played our iPads? To which I said, yeah, okay. So it was super cool. They did the the convention, and they were like, well, it's you had to pay extra money to get autographs and stuff. So they just like walked around. They came back early. We went and had dinner. Awesome night. So I'm getting ready to leave. Me and my brother-in-law uh, are walking towards the car park port, and there's a gelato place, and we're like, let's go get some gelato. Right. Who wouldn't want gelato? Right, as you do. And who's there but like some of the Sopranos people to haul wall of shame. I've actually never watched the Sopranos. Which is unconscionable. I, I yelled at you via text yesterday about that. Yeah, it's on it's actually on my HBO list now. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it. But turns out our boy Ray Abruzzo, who we've hey! been communicating on the Instagram, and we're, you know, spoiler alert, we're 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 in talks with maybe bringing him on the pod. And my brother in law was like, Hey, can we get a picture? to which I was like, well, you know, they they just were charging for pictures. We probably should. they said sure. They took a picture, and he's like, oh, go talk to him. And I was like, coming from New York, Keith, you can like, it's not something you do. You just no, you, you leave celebrities a damn load. Yeah, but we did. I, you know, I did say I did say hello, and as because we were stand, he was standing behind me in line for gelato, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I it crossed my mind to be like, yo, I'm from the Out of Practice podcast, but and then I was like, yeah, no, let's just get gelato. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, where is it? I did want to. I did want to 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 share this because I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, 
You had <laughs> ice cream with with Ray Bruzzo. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, he was really cool. He was really friendly, and it was fun. We had some he had some gelato all together. That's my brother in law on the bottom right, and then some Sopranos folks on the left, including Ray in the middle there. So it was uh, it was pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. That's a uh, I and it's it's so funny like the serendipity like we're to be like messaging with somebody from the show and then run into them in an ice cream store on the other side of the country. Yep. Like a week later. Pretty cool. crazy. Craziness. Very cool. Uh you know, but you know what? You know what we know Ray right from? Where what is that? Uh it's a it's it's a medium okay. that I wish I have some of. But you know what I really wish I could have? What's that? Oh, well done. Well segued, my friend. Ooh, I'm, you know, 300 some odd episodes into this. I'm getting good at it. So I promised last week we'd do a little bit of more TV. Uh, I just have a couple of things. I... I remember last episode that we did more TV, which is way back. I spoke for like 15 minutes. I will not do that, I promise. Uh, Mercifully. I will, I, I will go through these quickly, but uh, let's see here. The first thing I want to talk about is a show I like to call, a movie I saw uh, on the Disney Plus called Luca. Now, I'm a huge fan of Pixar, uh, though I will say that the last one onward, I guess, about brothers really didn't really strike me so much. Hmm. Uh, but this one is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if you've watched it yet. It's it's less, it's it, its ideas aren't as huge as Soul. I don't know if you watched Soul. That's one that would I think would speak to you. I'm sh- it, well, it, just like with all the Pixar's and it, it, frankly all animation in general. I, I was actually texting my buddy, uh, another buddy of mine, yesterday about it. It's like I never want to watch animation but i always enjoy it when i do which is a weird like thing because i'm like uh why would i want to i'm you know but then i get into especially like pixar movies the same way i will never choose a pixar movie but when it is thrust upon me i love it so you know the pixar movies are often their criticisms they get sometimes are that they're a little emotionally manipulative manipulative I don't know that I share that criticism. I understand about that. They do have the moments where they're like, this is the point where people will cry. What I like about Luca is that, first of all, it's 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 its themes are a little less huge. Like if you saw Soul, you know that it's about like where you begin as a soul, as a it's very the concepts are huge. This is a little more diorama based. It's it's a very small story that's isolated. It has some big themes, but it's just beautiful. The animation is it's not going the photorealism route. It's almost like an evolution of stop motion in a way. Mm. It's just beautiful. And it, the music that is scored is beautiful because it's it's based in Italy. It's an, It's got an Italian flavor. The director's Italian. And it, it just, everything about it is wonderful and beautiful and small scale. And I, I think it is better for that. It's got one of the best villains, I'll say bad guys, maybe in the past decade of cinema. Really? It's, wow. it's it's so funny it, and ah uh, it's just a really uh, it's it's such a little great movie. I, I you got to watch it. You got to You're getting watch more it. and more Italian as as the episode's it's, going on. It's really I've seen it about 4 times now. I just cuz the kids want to watch it and I, I just love it. So that's one wow. thing. Uh so that's what I've been watching as, as far as film is concerned. I downloaded Black Widow. I just haven't uh, watched it yet. Uh TV though, we got the Olympics, y'all. Yes, we do. Watch it. It's being broadcast in 4K from NBC and its affiliates. I know that there are questions surrounding the ethics, the socioeconomic uh, implications of the host cities. There's a whole bunch of crap if you want to get into the weeds of why the Olympics are bad. However, watching we talk, I talked about this when we talked about dancing before like how I, some something I can't do and I watch it like dancing it seems like magic to me and there's so little magic in the universe these days mm. watching young people in their 20s even younger there's a skateboarder from uh, Japan I believe who was 13 who medaled something ridiculous uh all the operating, gymnasts are like 15. At operating at the peak of human physical capabilities, there's something really magical about it. 
Um, and, you know, it's being broadcast in 4K HDR, so, like, that's awesome, too. So, the Olympics. What else yeah. do you have to say about the Olympics? No, I, I, it's, it's funny with the Olympics. I, I, when I watched the opening ceremonies, I became very sad mm-hmm. because of how affected it was by, by COVID and why that is still you know, uh, still having this huge impact. Um, but you're right. It's very exciting. You know, the 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 4K, I, I was expecting the 4K to be more impactful. But honestly, the difference between 4K and 1080 when you're three feet away is almost indistinguishable. Uh, but I, I, I do certainly enjoy it. Um, but, yeah, you know, and the HDR is coming through pretty good. Some of the some of the HDR implementa- imp- implementations we've seen recently, the All Star Game was just shitty. The MLB mm. All Star Game, like they couldn't do it. The, it. the colors are all weird and purple and shitty. Uh, but the but NBC seems to have their stuff together. It's it's a it's a great picture. And you're right, it's not like hugely impactful. I think 60 frames per second is much more impactful much with sports. More. Yeah. But nonetheless, if you can have all three, which we do with this broadcast, uh, why not? No, I'll I'll take it. You know, and it's the ethics of the Olympics. Uh, it's an interesting discussion. We should you know say for another time so we don't spend a four hour podcast. But I always feel torn during the Olympics because it, as a as a sports fan and a rooting fan, I'm you know rooting for the Americans. But I'm also just so keenly aware of how blazingly unfair our advantage is versus the rest of the world. And there's usually like one or two other countries that can compete with us on any of these things. But our budget and and the 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 way that we can support our athletes versus so many of these other countries, like it's it you know, we are sort of like stomping around like the giant gorilla. It's it's sort of like uh, it's like Major League Baseball without a salary cap. Mm-hmm. It's like the Yankees; they just can you know spend four hundred million dollars and put up an All Star team every year. And how is Kansas City supposed to compete with that? It's just that on steroids, well, literal that's, steroids. That's if you're said, Russia, you've got the American basketball team who lost the first game of competition since two thousand and four. Uh, so things can change. It's Katie Ledecky, who's one of the most juggernaut female swimmers, got knocked off the hundred meter. Right, uh, free right. last night. So things are happening. What I find is interesting also is that the way these games are being broadcast, which makes sense because they're happening in Japan, is it flies in the face of everything that our society is based on right now, which is like constant checking of your phone. Because if you don't want spoilers, if you want to watch the primetime coverage and have it be uh, fresh. Not ruined. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit. It's tough. You, you have to make a concerted effort, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, we could talk about the Olympics. Unless you hey. have another point, sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's 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 all I have. I will I will throw out one other quick TV shout out because uh, because I'm participating. Well, hold on, then you gotta wait. I have more to I have more. Oh to go. Jesus Christ! Yeah, you didn't think that was it. Uh, Big Brother, I've talked. He about said it I was before. gonna go faster, kids. Big Brother, I've talked about it before. I love it. It's still great. This new season is fresh, and I'm so glad that it's back. Also. Apple TV Plus. Do you watch Ted Lasso? If not, you need to watch Ted Lasso. Season one is amazing. Season two just started. Only two episodes have been released. I didn't want to like this show. I didn't want to watch this show. Everything that this show is based on, I hate. The fact that it was just a commercial that they tried to blow into a show. And I was like, the the basic premise is like, can we have this good guy stay a good guy and just be like a good guy? Where's the conflict? When's he gonna turn? When's it gonna? When's it gonna? Breaking Bad? Oh no! They're like, we're gonna make a good-natured show. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna see it through. And shocker, it's a rousing success in my opinion. And even though it's all the talk and everybody's hyping it, which makes me want to hate it even more because that's just my personality. It's still great. Add my voice to the list of voices that says, "Watch Ted Lasso." And if you don't have an Apple TV Plus subscription, hit me up. I'll give you mine. That's uh, just for oh, Keith. We should talk about that off, off air. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that wasn't for anybody else. Okay, Qu- uh, I'll keep rifling through very quickly. There's a uh, a documentary series on Netflix called "The Movies That Made Us." If you're a man of a certain age, woman of a certain age, that is the age Keith and I is. You have to watch this. Season two just dropped. That takes our favorite movies: Home Alone, Jurassic Park, uh, Pretty Woman, uh, Ghostbusters. It, the list goes on and on and just does a whole hour doc on the making of them and it's its tone is great. The nostalgia factor through the roof. Everyone has Netflix. Watch this series, please. 
I think this is it. Note two more things real quick. Sorry, I know I promised. Uh, <laughs> documentary, Netflix, Black Holes, The Edge of All We Know. If you're a science or a science fiction nerd, you have to watch this. Uh, Stephen Hawking uh, is doing math. <laughs> and it's, it, it, uh, and he, here's the basic premise. We wanted to see a black hole. In order to actually see the closest black hole to us, you need a telescope roughly the size of Earth, which, shocker, is very difficult to build, Keith. Not sure if you knew that. That's very large, the size mm -hmm. of Earth. Yeah, it's big. So what big. they actually did was they found, they triangulated the like six or seven biggest telescopes <clears throat> around the globe. And timed it so that they would all take pictures of the same area at the same time to create this image of the first, the first image humans have ever taken of an actual black hole in operation. If you can even try to comprehend the logistics necessary to, to, to coordinate that, you're talking there can be no cloud cover in any of those places, there can be no weather systems, figuring out how it could work, and then after spending all that money, does it work? You'll have to watch the documentary to know. It is, it is, I will give you this one warning. It is dense. It is dense. So go in uh, ready to pay attention or just really stoned. And then finally, Keith, you ever read comics? Uh, I did back in the day. I have an almost complete set of G.I. Joe comic books on the shelf right behind me. Okay, so I also read comics back in the day, but there's hard to find time as an adult to read comics. It's hard to even if you I was I have conceived about jumping back into comics because of the iPad and like it, it's easier now with that kind of a device without having to buy them. But like, where do you jump in? The thing with comics, especially if you have a an obsessive personality like you and I do, Keith, is yeah. Uh, I, I, how far back do I go? Can I where can I jump in? Are there any new lines I want to jump at? How many things? So I was like, I want to pick one thing, jump in, and just kind of get my feet wet. And I got a recommendation from a few friends. There is an anthology series. Uh, they're about seven in, but you can jump in at any book because they're all sort of self-contained stories. It's sort of like uh, Tales from the Crypt back in the day. It's very horror-themed. Uh, Tales from the Crypt meets uh, Black, Black Mirror, perhaps. It's called The Ice Cream Man. You can try it out. Uh, get the one, one, the first anthology book is like $1.99 in Comixology through Amazon. If you are a fan of horror, Stephen King, I'm talking to you, Keith, you have to read this comic. It is great. I'll give you the first three pages of the first anthology. Uh, Ice Cream Man is serving this kid. It's a little, it's like uh, middle America. The kid's like, uh, what do you want, little girl? Oh, I have a, a scoop of chocolate. This kid comes up and he's like, oh, where are your parents? And he's like, I, he's like, I'm a big boy now. I don't need my parents. He's like, okay, here's two scoops. Kid walks home. He's like, Mom, I'm home. But before he goes in, he puts on a, a he puts a, 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 a clothespin on his nose. And he just walks towards the kitchen. And that's where I'll leave it. Uh, it is awesome. It, this book is awesome. If you get it, if, if you get, so that, I'm just focusing on Ice Cream Man. I'm going to try to like read uh, the seven panels. So that's where we are. That's more TV. That was a lot. But uh, <laughs> uh, Keith, what, what have you been watching? Uh, Wow. Uh, at this point, I will just say uh, I have been watching uh, Resident Alien, which is okay. a, a Peacock series starring Alan Tudyk, uh, who is so good. And uh, I heard about it because uh, Star Trek, Tom Paris, Robert Duncan McNeil is a producer and directs many of the episodes. Uh, it, it's delightful. Yeah, check it out. Okay, folks, that was the <laughs> Mike's Brief 13-minute segment. <laughs> and I don't more TV. Oh, wow, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I got into it. What can I say? <laughs> We're going to have to, you're going to have to like do special episodes. Maybe that can be our like, uh, <laughs> like our Patreon. Yeah, sure. Because, uh, good Lord. All right. You know what that means? It's time to move forward mercifully into a segment we call Filings and Subpoenas. Yes, of course. Let's talk about our filings. And Earlier this year, I was considering moving oh, to Denmark. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I had to pull up. I was trying to... Trying Are you to doing fill. an audiobook? Was that an audiobook? <laughs> no, that was me reading Phoenix's last filing and subpoena. 
uh, because I had not um, because I had not pulled up filings and subpoenas. So while I was chastising you for taking too long <laughs> on your segment, I realized I had not pulled up the filings and subpoenas and had no idea if we even had any. But I was just going to talk as if we did. And guess what? Thanks to our good friend and moderator Phoenix Cage, we sure do. And Phoenix says. In three sequential episodes, this is the second one that had a guest star who would later who later went on to play a love interest of one of the Gilmore girls. The first was Scott Cohen as ADA Mitchell Wheeler. The second one you mentioned, Mac Zucre as Skip Hyman. Just a few days ago, I finished watching The Gilmore Girls for the first time. Have you seen The Gilmore Girls, Mike? Uh some of it, yes. As Jen See, watched that- it. So no. Now, now that's how more TV is supposed to go. <laughs> By the way, we have conflicting reports on the top song. We'll get there, but uh, I'm going to play the wrong one. So. Oh, oh, okay. I thought J Lo was still going this week. Is what uh, my uh, my information be- showed. My well, the source I use has the week ending, whatever date, oh. not the week starting. Interesting. So, so J-Lo we wins already... it back, but uh, we'll, no, you're going to hear J-Lo. Not win it back. All right, fine. Well, you know, who doesn't love hearing some J-Lo? Let us, uh, yeah. So if you would like to write us and uh, tell us we took too long on more TV, Mike, yeah, how would they, love how, it. How would love they it. chastise you, Mike? Well, they could write to you, who would then forward <laughs> it to me at outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com. You could also hit us up on the Facebook and be like, no like. Although I don't know if you can do that anymore, but Out of Practice Podcast, uh, that's the same for Instagram if you want to just uh, post a picture of you eating espresso gelato with Ray Brutzel. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. You had espresso gelato that late in the day? <laughs> I had to drive home. Oh, I see. I see. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Well, folks, finally, it is. <laughs> I'm giving Mike so much shit. That was actually a good segment. All right. Uh, we are finally ready to hop back into the time machine. It's going to be great. We are talking about April 14th, the year 2002. And uh, we have to answer the eternal question Mike, what was going on? This day in the basement. Well, Keith, I was preparing for my final jury of school. I have located the VHS. I have located a VCR to digitize it to DVD. And then I will then transfer it from DVD to my computer. So it's a project ahead. Uh, That's what I was doing. I will save it from there and ask you, Keith, were you doing the same? I was. Uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to see to see the VHS copy of your senior recital or your uh, jury. They they, led, they recorded your juries? Well, no. But what they did record was what we called our final showcase, which was like they... I it, see. It wasn't the showcase for agents, which was a separate thing. This was... They put together a, uh, a review. Uh, they segmented us into different groups, and they did a full, like, what they called a Broadway rehearsal process. So we brought in a real director, they brought in a music director, and we rehearsed it for seven days like you would a show, and then we put it up. So that's that's what it... And I have some 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 video of it. I, I don't know if the video... I'm sure it's going to be terrible. I have literally have not played it since 2002. So we will... Uh, nice. We'll see what... How the medium uh, lasted in a plastic Tupperware for the past 20 years. Well, I mean, on VHS, is a better chance of being alive than a DVD. That's true. Because when DVDs fail, they fail all the way. VHS dies slowly like the rest of us. Yeah, well, so I was doing kind of exactly the same thing because uh, a week after this episode aired, literally a week, was my senior recital at Eastman. Here is the program. We will talk all about the actual recital. I have pictures. I have a recording of the whole thing. Uh, I will try to find 15 seconds I don't want to kill myself listening to. However, I set this up last week. Uh, because this week, in preparation for that senior recital, which also counts as the jury, this is how you get your degree, this is the the culmination of your entire college experience at the music conservatory, is your senior recital. Everyone's gonna go, your family's driving in from wherever, It's it's a solo recital, it's about like an hour straight of just you singing, it's a huge, momentous occasion. And it's still and only one half of the length 
of this podcast. It is only one half of the length of the more TV segment. So <laughs> it's just called all TV. And uh, a comic. And a comic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a comic book for some reason. <laughs> I just Mike wanted to talk. Mike does a presentation. Uh <laughs> It's like, you know, like in sixth grade, you needed to do like a presentation for your class, but they didn't really give a shit about what you did it about. They just wanted to give you public speaking experience. So like I once did a presentation about Star Trek in mm-hmm. sixth grade. Where I just like talked about Star Trek for half an hour. And uh, it, I did one on, on Babe the Blue Ox. Not Paul Bunyan, mind you. Just the, just, just his, just his partner. <laughs> Fuck Paul. Oh, all right. Well, anyway, so as I was setting up the monumental importance of this recital uh which i would be just thrown out to the wolves uh here singing in uh in french and italian and german and english tons of stuff i i finished the recital with getsemane from superstar that was after an hour of singing no one understood everyone was like oh, what the fuck is 20 this? again oh yeah yeah anyway so all of this is to say uh this week there was a uh, the most important thing leading up to it, which is my dress rehearsal, where I have I have my pianist and I have the string quartet come in and my and my uh, professor and we have on the stage all full lights and everything. We're gonna do our dress rehearsal, and uh, I forgot I forgot uh, that I had a dress rehearsal. That morning. And uh, not only did I... It wasn't like, oh, it's at 10. I thought it was at 1. I forgot it was even happening at all. And uh, I had like 15 minutes. Like, oh, it's like, are, are you, it's funny you're not here. I thought you'd be here a little early. I got a text, phone call, an email. I didn't, think, I didn't have a uh, cell phone. A pig- some sort of a pigeon dropped off a Some message. sort of a pigeon. An owl dropped off. And I showed up for my dress rehearsal, not knowing any of my lyrics, not being warmed up or in any kind of a voice, and just like, it was literally the actor's nightmare, where you you just a thrust well, upon a stage and you're not and you're not prepared. You don't know anything, and I I I was just not prepared in any way, shape, or form. And so I went out there, and it was. The most, Im- one of the most embarrassing experiences of my life that just kept going and going and going. Because it wasn't just one song, it was an hour of music. And I had like little note cards with lyrics written on them that I scrambled at the last possible second. And I was like, I, I couldn't sing. I was nervous. Were I was being falling adjudicated apart. on this, or was it for like no. the tech crew and stuff? It, no, it, well, it was just for my, it, it was like the, the final run through with my, with my voice teacher. And I was like cracking all over the place. I didn't know any of the lyrics. I didn't know half of the, what I was doing. And it was excruciating oh, man. to do. Uh, and after my actual recital, I went and had a beer with my voice teacher. And the, the recital itself went fine. And he's like, Keith, I thought I was going to kill myself after your dress rehearsal. I, I was like... This is the biggest disaster I have ever seen in my life. I'm going to kill myself, was the quote <laughs> that I got from my professor. Because he's like, I'm associated with that guy, and he's about to blow it. He, like, that, this was a face plant of epic proportions that I will never forget that feeling. And, and, it, and it, it wasn't just, like, on stage. It was the, the minute I realized it was happening, I was like, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I was completely, profoundly unprepared to do this, and uh, it—I mean, it was—it it was really indicative of how my head was just not in it at this point. And, and we'll talk about it next week for the recital itself because I sort of had an epiphany in the middle of the recital. But it, it was—I I can't believe how like self-destructive it was for me to be so out of it with this and just and and it's just like my head was not in it i was just 
barely participating at this point. I was doing a lot of stuff. Like there was, there's a lot happening, but like, it's my senior recital. I just, I, I, there's something in my head that I was just like, I'm, I can't process this. I don't want to do this. And, uh, <laughs> so apparently I just didn't. I can't wait to hear the, the redemption next week. The redemption. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's like a, a, a redemption, but I do get through the damn thing. And I, they do and let no me graduate. One commi- and your teacher didn't commit suicide, so that's great. He, yes, he, he did make it through uh, that semester. So, oh, that was embarrassing for us all. I still feel the shame inside me right now as I talk about it. That was rough. So, let's take this opportunity to zoom out a little bit. Let's get away from Kilbourne Hall. It's, it's not a good place for me at that point. And talk about... What's going on? It's time for the Out of Practice Podcast's This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. Okay, well, we're in a big fight about it, but the top song was actually Foolish by Ashanti. Say some, say some. Some some people would say it's foolish by Ashanti, and some people would say it's Jennifer Lopez. Uh, local paper, Burlington Free Press talked about Powell and Arafat will meet the leader of the Palestinian Liberation uh, or Army PLO organization. I I should know that. Uh, anyway, so glad we solved that. The top movie was Changing Lanes which was a uh, Ben Affleck and Samuel L. Jackson movie, which I don't think I've, I've ever seen. Maybe I, I think, have? I think you summarized it pretty well. Uh, it was a movie that had uh, Ben Affleck and Sam L. Jackson in it. That's really the long and short of it. That's, that's really all you need to know. That's, that, that was the actual script. <laughs> it's like they, they opened up the script and the, what is it? Oh, 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 okay. So just the two of us? Okay, great. Just shoot it. Great. Uh, okay. Well, that's, uh, again, April 14th, the year 2002, and now it's time for the most important segment, also including a mea culpa. Here it is, folks. Here it is, folks. It's time. It's time. It's time, time. It's time for sports. Oh, the things I got wrong. Well, folks, I've been giving you hockey stats from the 0203 season, not the 0102 season, so spoiler alert. In our correct timeline, the regular season is still going on, and the Flyers beat the Rangers 2-1 behind goals from former Bruins Adam Oates and future Bruin Mark Recchi. The Bruins themselves didn't need either, blowing out the Penguins 7-1 at the Garden. So, uh, yeah, no, I've been uh, pulling up the wrong stats. Eh, shit happens, man, shit happens. Much like you pulling up the wrong number one song, I pulled up the wrong stats, uh... For, uh, I don't know how long have I been talking about hockey for the last four or five episodes. So, uh, look out for season seven. You might know what's going to happen 20 years ago. All right, folks. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. And I'm not going to take this anymore. It's time to talk about the damn episode. Oh, boy. Boy, we are finally here. Your thumbs are tired from skipping over us, and you are now (laughs) ready to listen to us talk about The Practice Season 6, Episode 18, The Return of Joey Herrick. And it's not just the return of Joey Herrick. Folks, it is the return of David E. Kelly. Thank God for the first episode since Eyewitness... David E. Kelly is the writer, the sole writer on this episode. In fact, uh, you might notice because the show's been a little bit different, it's because he only wrote on six episodes so far this entire season. And this is the first one, I think, since the beginning, since the, fir- uh, since the first episode, that he wrote by himself. So we, I think we're going to get back to some classic practice. I'm so excited uh, it was directed by Dwight H. Little, who last directed on Liar's Poker. And that brings us with only one last thing to do before we listen to the episode, and that is... What is that supposed to mean? What's your problem? 
Is this what happens to women when you insert your penis? What? What? Oh. <laughs> what does Mike, Mike think's gonna, gonna happen? Yeah, Keith might have hit the now, space bar. The curdled milk. Then what would have happened? Guys, you know he's back. I know he's back. Everybody knows he's back. David E. Kelly knew he was coming back, so David E. Kelly's like, I'm back. All right, so that's where we're starting. But here's the thing. If you remember when we last saw Joey Herrick, am I mistaken in remembering that he defended himself? He sure did. And then kind of disappeared. What was he doing in all that time? I'm saying he passed the bar, y'all. He is now a lawyer, and somehow, through some twist of fate, I'm waffling, Keith, because on one hand, I want to say that he 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 applies for a job. He wants to now work for the firm. Ooh, that would really spice things up. Or something happens to one of our friends, be it Bobby. No, well, Bobby's always been. One of us has to be defended, and somehow we would. That's just that's too implausible. I'm going to say <laughs> Joey Herrick. Joey Herrick applies at the firm. All right, and. Uh, I'm trying to think of what some twist of machination that would get him to have to 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 like be on the case with us. Do like a ride along. Somehow Joey is going to do a ride along on our case this week. Wow. And uh not only that, but he is going to put the super hard press sexually onto Duh. Lindsay creating an incredible conflict between he and Bobby. All the hallmarks of Sexy practice. <laughs> now I, I I'm with you. I'm so glad you were able to to uh, stick the sexy landing there, <laughs> uh, Olympic style. However, uh, I I hate to you know throw cannon on you, but uh, Joey's gay. All right. Well, hmm. for S S Steve, Ooh. he's going he's going for Eugene then. Oh, all right, right. So he's and not going like, the obvious Bobby. He's going to go to Steve. And Eugene's like, don't fuck me, Joey. <laughs> I, I don't do a good Eugene, and I learned that right now. But... Every piece of that was wrong and offensive. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. That was my Eugene. <laughs> the, the, like, side, the side eye, the like smoky voice, and he's like, and he says things real fast. I mean... <laughs> You know, it is, just because you're offended, I thought I thought it was a pretty good Eugene. So what? You know what? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Don't fuck me, Mike. <laughs> I mean, unless you think Eugene's into it, and he's like, "All right, Joey." <laughs> and then Joey's like, "How you doing?" All right. Anyway, I'm just yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, here's here's the, the here's the question we all want answered. I got a very big dick. <laughs> oh, my God. If you right. want to listen to us talk about Joey's big old dick, you can do so by tuning in to our, you know, podcast that we do, <laughs> which you can find <laughs> on your podcast service of choice or just by hitting this QR code that I do for my health. Uh, <laughs> and that way you can skip the, the hour of podcast that we've already done and get right to the good stuff. And we will see you back here for the After Show Show! Show Show! And we are ba 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 back, ba ba baby. Ba back baby, here we go. We just watched The Practice, Season 6, Episode 18, The Return of Joey Herrick. Woo-hoo! Really fun. Uh, it, just in case you missed it, we know you didn't miss it. You're not going to like not watch that episode and listen to us talk about it. Come on. We all know what's going on here. Y'all, you know, watched it on Hulu, which you paid full price for your subscription for, uh, and not sharing it with your friends. But just in case, let's do a segment we like to call... Mm, two, three, four. Mike has 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. Segment. segment. Hey, segment. guess what? Joey Herrick's back. They always forget that second part. Joey Herrick's back, and he is uh, defending a guy who's you know on trial for murder. Also, Jimmy's friend Jennifer is also back from season two, and she got raped, or did she? Turns out, it doesn't look like she did. She just siphoned money from all those rich people, and 
Joey was banging that guy, killed his wife, and uh, yeah, got away with it. And put him in jail for murder. Oh, yeah, th- that too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, there we go. Can you uh, do it all again? Just in, you know, fewer syllables? Joey C is back. Jen works a sex scheme for cash. A killer lawyer. Okay, very good. Except for uh, uh, Joey H. You said Joey C. <laughs> why did I? Why did I say that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely Joey H. Joey H, Joey H, yeah. but that, that yeah, very good. <laughs> and, uh, you had a typo. You had a typo in yeah, your yeah, it happens scene. to the best of us. It's cool. Yeah. And you want to know what happens to the best of us and the worst of us? It's time for an award show. The Out of Practice Podcast, in unofficial, unsolicited, unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions, proudly present. Oopsie. Oopsie. Oopsies! Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good, and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now, here are your hosts, Keith and Mike! What the hell are the oopsies? Well, Jackie, they're a fake awards show that begins every week. With everyone's favorite, everyone just may, maybe turn up your headphones just mm-hmm. a little bit. If there's other noise in the room, you know, tell the kids to shush because you really want to take this. Oh, and now that we know everything's fine, Keith, we can really indulge. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's true. Now that you don't need surgery, <laughs> even though this clip might make you think, ah, maybe we need some anyway. <laughs> it's time for. Never gets old. Guys, what if you want to lose in order to put an innocent person in prison so that you don't have to go in prison? And just to do that, you pass the bar. I would say that makes you a pretty awesome lawyer. So well, why can't Joey H be most valuable lawyer for himself? He, the value was for himself, right? He's been most valuable lawyer before. Yeah, why stop that now? No. And, you know, if if the most valuable, but if you're going to be, if you're going to go from the point of view of a sociopath, most valuable is most effective at getting what you want. That has although, nothing to do although, with good although, or bad. Although, although, although. Although. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to argue with myself. I would say that he also presented a damn good case. I, it would be plausibly believable if they returned a not guilty verdict because he did provide a great plan B and some reasonable doubt. However, he did, he did then let that assault thing slip in at the last minute. That's why he put him on the stand to ensure that he would get the last minute. So it looked like he put on a great case and that he was excellent in his deception. Yes. In fact, I, cause I was going to say, part of what makes him effective here is that he 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 threw a case but did it in such a way that made it look like he was trying to win the case so therefore it can't really be overturned on appeal because of bad because ineffective counsel because he was effective he just happened to lose so uh i don't know i i think it's pretty cut and dry yes congratulations joey herrick on your most valuable lawyer Award coming up next. Oh boy, can can he get a three peat? But uh, I'll tell you after we dance. Already famous because you've been on TV, getting a paycheck. Watch first entry on your IMDb. Way to go! But you're the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor on the episode. Y'all, 
Uh, lots to shout out here. I want to shout out uh, the actress who plays Jennifer. Tracy Mittendorf. Tracy, because she, speaking of excellent in their deception, she was excellent here too. Not only did she pull the con, but she also had to screw Jimmy in that con. Now, I think she would justify it in her head that they took these rich people down and Jimmy got his piece of the 175 and all as well. But she did have to take her friend for a ride in order to do that. And it's not the first time. And even though we've been we've been through, you know, David E. Kelly used her last arc to convince us, the audience, that we were going to give her the deference of the the benefit of the doubt. She wasn't she and she played that script perfectly. She she brought us along for the ride. She was excellent. However, I just don't know how John Larroquette can. He. Not only did he chew the scenery up, but the sheer joy it's clear that he has in playing this yeah. character is yeah. effusive. And we take it, we enjoy it, and it's nice to root for the bad guy. At no time during any piece of this episode did you not know that he was going to pull some shit. I didn't of figure it out until when they exactly when they wanted me to figure it out, because we'll talk about that the great writing and pacing and all that in a moment. But it, this was a tour de force. Every time he shows up, it's a tour de force. Even when he randomly like jigsaws himself into a, a hospital monitor for just like a right. cameo, it's still great. So there's just no way that John Larroquette is wasn't gonna come and just like steal this oopsie right right off the right off the desk. But uh, he did so with a plum uh, because he is just excellent in this episode. Not only does he chew the scenery, but he also grounds it when he needs to, to play the character of the lawyer. And every time he teases Bobby and 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 sort of rubs it in their face, it's just so excellent. You'd almost think it's gonna be difficult to juxtapose that sort of carefree performance with the other case, but we'll talk about it later. I feel like they, they pulled it off. So uh, I think that John Larroquette gets another oopsie on his shelf. Yeah, well, uh... Previously, he had a pair of oopsies. Now he's gonna have three. And I, I, instead of saying anything, I think he just deserves this. Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, 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 the Massachusetts, 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 Massachusetts. Yes, yeah. I mean, come on, John Larroquette, take it away, uh, please. In an alternate universe in which the show is still running, he joins the firm as Joey Herrick and becomes a regular character. Uh, in, in, in which case, it would not have been canceled ever. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, get him and Denny Crane together and let's see where it goes. Yeah, well, we'll see. Okay, let's. Whoa, Keith, dropping the hot take. The cr- breadcrumbs. Little breadcrumbs, little breadcrumbs. We'll see, we'll see. But first, we have to see who I'm is well the. You killed your podiatrist or blew the case, but you let a single tear run down your face. You're the best actor on the show. You know, when I, I wrote that jingle, I forgot that all of those things actually happened. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, be, like I I forgot that Eleanor eventually would actually kill her podiatrist. Listen, uh, Keith and I have talked about, and, and maybe some of you have rolled your eyes at us talking about the the reacting skills of some of our cast. This episode is a super example of excellent reactive acting. Just watch Dylan McDermott and Cameron and uh, uh, Lisa Gay Lisa Gay Hamilton reacting throughout this entire episode. Yes, they all get some great lines to deliver, some great one-liners, but just that Bobby's realization in real time of the Joey Herrick scheme is awesome. As Keith mentioned, the multifaceted reaction of Lisa Gay in that uh, scene towards the end is excellent. It's just great. Uh, even that scene where like Avengers, Avengers assemble behind Jimmy, uh, as sort of hokey as it actually is, because like Jimmy didn't know they were coming and they like planned this great 
it's a little hokey, but it's not hokey, and it actually was kind of moving because of how excellent this cast is. Uh, so that's awesome. However, uh, I think that Michael Badalucco is my Oopsie Award winner just because you see his compassion and dedication to his friend through this entire episode. You see the, you feel and see the David versus Goliath types of uh, battle that he's waging here, even though it's a beat we've run before. Uh, and then you see sort of his anger and and crushing emotional defeat at the end. And it's all just superb. So Michael Badalucco, uh, best actor. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I, I think it's, it is Michael's episode, at least of our main cast. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he it, he's he really does um, righteous anger well. There's you know it, certain certain characters are sort of better than that. Another we see it from Bobby all the time, but like Steve Harris really crushes it. Michael really crushes it. Lisa Gay really crushes it. And uh, yeah, but, but but this time it was tinged with like heartbreak because like he's had his heart broken by this woman over and over and over again and it's uh it's all honest there and um i i you know i i, I mentioned you mentioned it, i mentioned about lisa gay's reaction while uh while jimmy is sort of putting the screws to this woman what i loved about what lisa gay did in that moment is she was able to in one look say like fuck you you're right jimmy oh god this is heartbreaking I feel weird about this, and yet I know this is the right thing to do. I'm sad, and I'm... Like, all of it in, like, a split second, all of these things washed over her face in that one moment, and it's really extraordinary acting. But, uh, anyway, so, Michael Badalucco, congratulations on your Best Actor Award. Coming up next, our good friend, here as always... The Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. Guys, this is how good Joey Herrick is. Joey Herrick can convince us of anything. He can become a, a lawyer. He can even fool a stadium full of people into thinking that he is Tom Brady. So this week, it's actually Ooh. Joey Herrick Brady uh, winning the Tom Brady. The first time a non-Tom Brady has actually won Ooh, the Tom a Brady Tom Award Brady impersonator. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Fake Brady. It's Joey Herrick. Tom Brady. Congratulations on your Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. Coming up next, it's our it's our grand finale. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to announce how many spare tires this episode gets. So yes. Am I pumped that Joey Herrick's back? Yes. Am I going to probably unfairly inflate my rating because Joey Herrick's back? Yeah, probably. But here's the thing. David e. Kelly walked a tightrope this episode. He gave us the like slightly comedic Joey Herrick tonality juxtaposed with a really serious plot line with Jennifer and Jimmy uh, and also took us through twists and turns in both episodes. And what I thought was really well handled, both from a directing aspect, writing aspect, and performance, just a pacing aspect, was that we sort of get cocky with ourselves in kind of almost beat by beat predicting along with Bobby and the and the firm what's happening in the Joey Herrick case, right? The revelation sort of comes about organically and and we're led to believe we feel a little bit proud that we're figuring it out but also it's he lays the breadcrumbs kind of throughout the episode so that's cool but in the other case it's the direct opposite i really did i didn't figure that out until the very end right they even kind of in the deposition they plant the seed that there's something there's another layer but we're so celebratory in our bringing down goliath again that he fools us because when the, the Avengers assemble moment in that uh, deposition scene, I think becomes the focal point for me, the, the new viewer, rather than the, oh, wait, what's what? how is this truth being obfuscated here? So I, I, I thought that was great because it does allow for like a, a twist 
that is not just a gotcha twist, which is what we complain about often, but a great emotional twist for Jimmy, for us, and the fact that even when we are in the righteous pursuit, right, from Eugene saying, look, we're going after them, from the firm coming and saying, we support Jimmy, we support this poor victim, and then us getting screwed at the end, <laughs> it's awesome. It's a, we're fighting for the right thing, but we win for the wrong reasons, the other case is we're fighting for the wrong reasons and we lose for the right reason. It's all it's all things. Add on top of that, it's paced really well. Add on top of that, the performances front to back to back to front are excellent and is in and more than that, superlative in some ways. Um it's a great episode. I, I don't have a lot of nits to pick. Uh even the Joey Herrick it, it, even Every, you could write any, this is one of those things, you could write him any sort of plot and, it, and they'll find a way to make it work. Uh, I'm glad David E. Kelly's back. Uh, I mean, I guess we could make a comment, a social comment on, by making the victim, making Jennifer sort of a, the, the villain here, there's probably a, a larger social commentary that is hurt because of it. Don't worry, it's coming. Yeah, but... It's an episode of television, uh, and uh, it's a really great one. Uh, because of the implication there at the end, I think I'm going to ding it from being like in my top tops, but I'm going to give it 8.97 spare time. Woo, so close to nine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with all of that. And there's, I have a couple thoughts. Uh, one, I'll, I'll just, I'll start with the ding right away um you know i i was so on board with us sticking up for this sex worker this person this this um person from a from a type of people who are constantly taken advantage of and not st you know stood up for and um you know and so i i loved that we believed the victim, our heroes believed the victim, and we went to battle for her, and that, and that made me feel great. I was like, "Wow, this is really maybe a little ahead of its time." I, I'm, I'm so on board. I did not like the twist. I did not like the fact that, oh wait, no, she is this devious liar because I, it, it's, it's not like it's not a valid story, and it's not like it wasn't interesting in a vacuum. But just in a in a world in which we uh, are are struggling to believe victims, we are struggling to particularly believe victims uh, who are disadvantaged. And uh, so I I didn't I didn't like that leaning into the stereotype that all sex workers are like liars and devious this that the other thing. So like. Yes, let I me, have let that me, thought. Let, let me make a qualification to that ding because I, I gave it a little short shrift on my side and I want to add to what you're saying. Yes, everything you just said, yes. However, I think what's more damaging in the in the big picture is not the fact that they made her that devious because they did give her that little bit of a sentence to Jimmy of why she did it and all these things. What's more damaging is that is how easily they let the men off the hook, right? Clearly they show the main guy with his family and then when the other guy comes in to give his... What they give him like a hero scene because right. he comes in and he's truthful, even though he just lied in a deposition and also, you know, did have sex with the prostitute. That's like oh, she's well, although, she's a professional versus a guy who's just like you know. So they let the men yeah, off the no, hook. No, and easily. I, I, well, I, I, I think in his case, we don't know if he has a family. We don't know if he's married. So from his point of view, he met what he thought was an advertising executive in a bar and hooked up. There's nothing wrong with that. So like uh, him, okay, fair. Him, I'm with. But the you know the Larry Pressman character, like we let him off the hook. He's cheating on his wife with a wildly younger woman. His deniability that I didn't know she was a prostitute, even though he's like 65 and she's 25, and like eh, you had to have a. I mean, I, again, like there's there's not enough scrutiny put on his decision-making process. So I, I, I think it's a good point. And it's, it's a point that I was going to bring up, but then I forgot. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, that said, that said, that said, in a vacuum, 
as just an interesting episode of television with twists and turns and emotional implications. If if we lived in a world that treated victims and sex workers with the proper respect and interest and, and compassion, then this would be a great story because it'd be like, oh, wow, what a surprise. And, you know, because we all sorts of classes of people who aren't marginalized we tell these stories where it turns out twist, they did something bad. We're like a hundred percent on board. So like the, you, you sort of have like the, the bigger picture intruding on this story. Uh, now to get to the, to get to the meat of the issue, the Joey Herrick case. So many times we have dinged this show on, um, when it verges into the ridiculous, when it verges into the silly, a little bit. And I I think silly is not the problem. In an episode like this, the the character of Joey Herrick and the episodes that he's in are patently silly. They're they're ridiculous. But if you do silly extraordinarily well, both from a writing standpoint and from a performing standpoint, it's okay. We're still on board. The issue is not that it verges into silly. It's when you're silly and bad, it's you know it's it's a little bit like, you know, uh, a comedy about dark stuff. It's not that you can't be funny. It's just you have the 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 bar is set very high before it, it it's where it, it becomes funny and not offensive or upsetting or whatever it is. So uh, the Joey Herrick character is. Re- Ridiculous. Remember, like the scene. In fact, we uh, in our intro from this, we see him in the acting good section. He's got a piano in jail, and he's singing a song in his jail cell with a piano. Like, yeah. what the hell is that? But we don't care because it's so funny and so well performed, and uh, and it's appropriate to the character. So, this is a case where. Like, David E. Kelly comes in and says, like, no, this is how you do it. This is how you structure an episode. This is how you build a character. This is how you build a storyline so that you can get away with the twisty McTwist. That doesn't feel ridiculous. It feels earned and not, like, annoying. And and you can have this broad, chin-suing, <laughs> scenery-chewing performance from an actor... This is how you can get away with it and still feel like we're in the real world. Uh, so, uh, you know, this it's a return to form. This is what I miss. I've been missing this, you know, not necessarily Joey Herrick, but just sort of like the confidence and the, the justified, whatever you're going to do, do it well enough so that it's justified. Um, and so, yeah, I really liked this episode. I'm going to ding it half a point, uh, you know, for the, for the not believing the, or, not that they did believe, uh, but for that for that story. But even still, Return of Joy Herrick, you're getting the full nine for me. Ah, uh, you know what? Maybe bump it a little bit, Keith. So, our, so maybe our average comes up to nine. All right, nine point oh three. Okay. So the average is exactly nine. Wow, like there it, it is, like it. folks. Uh yeah, really, really fun. Uh, we have one more thing to do before we hit the bumper. So that's Joey Herrick uh, as his original lawyer form, in his original lawyer form. Is that what that is? That's right. That's, uh, that is Dan from Night Court. The original Joey Herrick is a, uh, an annoying lawyer, uh, naturally. A little obvious, a little on the nose, but that's kind of how we work with, uh, with Joey Herrick. Well, folks, you've gotten through a pretty good episode of The Practice. If you would like to reach out and talk to us, you can email us at outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. While you're at it, do us a huge favor. Nobody's done it in 17 years. Join the jury by leaving us a rating and review. You can uh, just put it on Apple Podcasts or any other service of your choice. Let us know. We'll read it. We're going to welcome you to the jury. Speaking of people who are always welcome on our show and in our hearts, please welcome our founding sponsors, Jorge Navoa, Cloud Lover 69, Leanne Wrights, 
Jennifer Masanova, and Ari Kuhn. Did you know you can get your name on that list? You can force Keith to have to Photoshop that list. I have to Any find the file. I have to want. type it in. Any spelling, Keith will do it. Do you enjoy us shouting over bumpers? If so, you can donate money by clicking one of our two links to leave a one-time contribution or a monthly contribution. We appreciate those who have done it and those who have sustained their contributions. It helps us keeping ourselves doing this. Hey, you know what? Go to law school, pass the bar, kill your boyfriend's wife. As long as at the end of it, you take some time to come back to where it all started and give us some laser sounds. Laser sounds.